Hello, welcome back to another episode of Hermitian Forms. This time we're talking about pseudo-reflections and isometries. So just as a reminder, last time we talked about Hermitian Forms, we introduced the definition and we talked about how they're sesquilinear maps and they satisfy this additional property that the form is conjugate symmetric. So it's linear in the first variable and conjugate linear in the second variable. And a Hermitian space is just a complex vector space and it's got some Hermitian form. And we're going to be talking about finite dimensional vector spaces for now. And we also talked about this good property that some vector spaces have uh, that's called non-degenerate. And that means that its radical is zero. What does that mean? That means that the only non-zero or the, there are no non-zero elements that perp with every element in the vector space. So another way of saying that is that every non-zero element has some other element with which it pairs to be something non-zero. So that's what it means to be non-zero, uh, non-degenerate. So we're just going to say that the vector space is non-degenerate with there being assumed to be some form Usually we'll state what that is, but that's what we mean when we say that the vector space is non-degenerate or, or the form is non-degenerate. They both mean the same thing. So we also can talk about subspaces being non-degenerate. So we get another Hermitian space or Hermitian form if we just restrict the form to entries from a subspace. And so here's the restriction. It just takes the Hermitian form, but you can only, you're only allowed to have elements from the subspace. So that's the restriction of the Hermitian form. And so now we can talk about a subspace, a subspace being non-degenerate if that, that form is non-degenerate, that restriction is non-degenerate. So for every non-zero element in U, it takes, it pairs with something else in U to be something non-zero it can't take everything else in u to zero. Otherwise it would be in the radical, and then you would have a non-zero radical, and then you can't have that if it's non-degenerate. The radical equals zero if it's non-degenerate, if and only if. So we're just gonna say that that subspace is non-degenerate. Instead of saying that the form restricted to u is non-degenerate each time. It's just a little easier to say. So now we can introduce a new symbol called, in, in tech it's obot. So if you have two Hermitian spaces, we can define their orthogonal sum. That's the symbol obot here. Is, and that's the just O plus, like normal, but with the additional thing that the Hermitian form is defined like this. So if you've got two Hermitian spaces, when you O plus them together, the way their form works is you just add their forms together with, with, e with each component. So I hope that makes sense. And then sometimes we'll talk about uh, OBOT with two subspaces of the same space. So if, if it's the case that U and W are in the same, in the same space, then the way the Hermitian form works in that case is that it's very similar. We just require that U perp with everything in W and W perp with everything in U. And that's the intuition on why we use this OBOT notation. So we got a little perpendicular sign in there. It's O plus and perpendicular at the same time. Now we got a little proposition. And I really like the symmetry on this thing. So if we got a non-degenerate space and a subspace that may or may not be non-degenerate, the following are equivalent. So if that subspace is non-degenerate, then you get all these things. Its perp, which is also a subspace, must also be non-degenerate. Another useful thing is that this one right here, that if you know if you have a non-degenerate subspace, then you can decompose V to be U. Obot its perp. 
and these two we can easily see that are the same thing because what does it mean for to be non-degenerate? It means its radical is zero. But what is u intersect u perp? That is the radical of u, isn't it? That is the elements in u that perp with everything in u. So if that's zero, that means its radical is zero. That means it's non-degenerate. We'll talk uh, just a moment more about this proposition in the next video. I'm going to leave it for now, but we're going to remember those facts. So last time we talked about the hyperbolic plane for Hermitian spaces and how that's a two-dimensional complex plane with basis elements that are isotropic vectors, which means that they both have length zero. We I haven't said this. Uh, or, or written this down in the in the presentations, but we say that x has length zero if hxx equals zero, and and so forth. So, anyways, this is the hyperbolic plane. They pair with one another to be one, and we get this proposition that if we have a non-degenerate Hermitian space, that good property, that we can decompose v like this, or we have a finite number of copies of the hyperbolic plane along with some anisotropic subspace which remember what that means that means that you don't have any you don't have any vectors of non-zero length or sorry of, of zero length every vector has non-zero length so you could not have this happen in an anisotropic space everything would be non-zero there so that's what the proposition says you can decompose V into some finite number of hyperbolic planes with its uh, obot, its some anisotropic space. And now I'm going to have to stop the video. <laughs> okay, so here's how that works. If the space is anisotropic, if V is anisotropic, then you can just let V let W be V, and then you're done. If V is isotropic, is then it has some isotropic vector. And then so similar to the, the trick in the last video, you can find a hyperbolic partner. You can find another element with which it forms a hyperbolic plane. And then that will be non-degenerate, because remember the hyperbolic plane is non-degenerate. And so you can break it off into the hyperbolic plane with something else with it with its perp. And then if that's anisotropic then you're done if not you just repeat the previous kind of idea and then you just keep doing that and eventually you'll you won't have to do that anymore because v is finite dimensional and each hyperbolic plane has dimension two so each time you find a isotropic vector you you can break it off two dimensions and just keep doing that anyway so that's that as a corollary to that any Hermitian space has the decomposition like this. And so it looks very similar to the last proposition. So here's how this works. You can just take a basis for the radical, because the radical is the subspace of the space. And then you just extend that basis to a, a basis for the whole space. And that extended part will be non-degenerate because if there's something in that extension part that takes everything else to zero well it also takes everything else and it also takes everything in the radical to zero so then it must be in the radical and then so it must be zero so you take a basis for the radical and then you extend it to a basis for the whole space which will be non-degenerate and then you just apply the previous proposition here and that's how that works. And a much easier corollary, if we have a non-degenerate non-zero space, then there's a non-isotropic vector. There's some vector with non-zero length. And that's because hyperbolic planes and anisotropic spaces both have both have non-isotropic vectors. So that's that. Now we can talk about pseudo-reflections. So if you have a non-degenerate Hermitian space, and suppose there's a non-isotropic vector, so there's some vector of non-zero length, then 
that space generated by that, that one dimensional complex space is non-degenerate. And so that by that proposition that we talked about earlier, you can write V as X with its O bot, its perp. You can decompose it like that. So remember that's O plus and these two have to be orthogonal to each other and that's good. So here's how we're going to define a pseudo reflection. If you take some element on the unit circle, then we could define a pseudo reflection as the map like this, where if if uh, v is decomposed like this, then every element in v must look like this. Must it must be a multiple of x plus something in x perp. And the map just multiplies alpha by that multiple of x, and then it leaves y fixed. So that's how the pseudo reflection works. So here's an example. We have three dimensional space, and maybe we can write uh, that as z1 with its perp, and then maybe we just want to rotate that that guy by 90 degrees. So we would multiply by i. So that would be, it. but it leaves these two guys fixed. That would be an example. So we're not going to talk about this very much, but here's how you could define the pseudo reflection. It's the same thing. It looks a little better than just leaving this off, I guess. But this simplifies to this, and you can check that if you want. But we're going to use this formula for the pseudo reflections because it's simpler. So if we have a linear map of Hermitian spaces that preserves the lengths between the vectors, then we call this map metric. Makes sense. And so if it's a, also a linear isomorphism, if it's a bijection, then we call that an isometry. So this is the notion of isomorphism or homeomorphism equivalence for Hermitian spaces. Basically, we're going to say that two Hermitian spaces are the same if they're isometric to one another. If the, there's some map that preserves the preserve the, so the distances, and it's got to be a bijection, of course, as well. So that's what an isometry is. Pseudo reflections that we just talked about are isometries. They're metric. You just use the sesquilinear property here, and you can see that it's it's metric, and it's also invertible. So remember that linear algebra thing that says if it's invertible endomorphism, then it's a bijection as well. So if and only if. And so pseudo reflections are isomorphisms, or iso isometries. Now we can talk about Witt's lemma. So just remember that uh, we talked about earlier that x has length 1 if h of xx equals 1. We just kind of say that informally to make it easier because we've got to say these things a lot. Or it has length 0 if h of xx equals 0. So it's isotropic if it has length 0. So get that terminology straight. So here's the basic form of Witt's lemma that we're going to use. It says that if we have a non-degenerate Hermitian space and we've got two non-isotropic vectors with the same length, then there's a product of at most two, two pseudo-reflections that sends one to the other. So basically you got two vectors of the same length, this non-zero, then you've got an isometry over your space that sends one vector to the other vector. And you've got an additional thing here, but we're not going to talk about that. But that's true as well. And here's a little sketch of how that goes. Basically, you want to you want h of xy to be real and have opposite sign to the length of h of xx and h of yy. Remember that in Hermitian spaces you can have, you've got to have a real length. You can't have an imaginary part because of that Hermitian property that h of xx 
must equal the conjugate of h of xx. So it must be real. So if h of xy has the opposite sign to h of xx and h of yy, then that's good. We can just use this pseudo-reflection here and then, and then just check that it works. Um, why do we need this to have opposite sign to this? That will ensure that this guy has, I believe, non-zero length. And then, and then so we get the non-degenerate space, and then so we, so, and then so the pseudo reflection makes sense. If this is not real, and does not have opposite sign to this, then that's okay. We can just compose it with something that we can just basically rotate it around the unit circle and to where it's the right the right guy and so we just scale it and then we just then we just compose our scaling map with our original map that worked and then we just show that that works so that's how so that's Witt's lemma if we got two vectors of non-zero length with the same length then we can find an isometry that sends one to the other and last thing that we're going to talk about today is orthogonal bases. So orthogonal basis is like a orthonormal basis if you remember that from analysis. What is that? That means that every you got a basis and essentially every vector has length one in that basis and each vector is orthogonal to every other vector in the basis. So that would be an orthonormal basis. We can't do that for Hermitian spaces because some vectors can have length zero, some vectors can have negative lengths. So what we can do though is we can form an orthogonal basis to where they're all orthogonal, similar to the orthonormal case. But instead of them all having length one, we can make sure that they all have length either negative one, zero, or one. So it's got to be either positive, zero, or negative, and then we just scale the positive ones to be one, and we scale the negative ones to be, or we scale the negative ones to be negative one. <laughs> Can't get away with saying negative one twice there. And then the zeros will be a basis for the radical. I didn't say that here, but. You can keep that in mind. When you form an orthogonal basis, however many zeros you get, that will be your basis for your radical. So here's a sketch of how this works. Remember that we talked about earlier how we can decompose V like this. Some product of hyper or some sum of hyperplane, hyperbolic planes, some anisotropic space, and the radical. So let's just talk about this anisotropic space for a second, because that's the the only tricky part really. So we just define the projection like this guy and we use the Gram-Schmidt process which maybe you've seen before. And this is a process which will basically just help us take a basis and then it'll ensure that or we'll get a new basis that will all the elements will be orthogonal to one another. So it's a little sort of induction kind of thing. And then we get new, so we just take any basis for it, and we, then we just get a new basis, which is all orthogonal to each other. And then we can just scale them properly so that, you know, they all have length one or negative one, and that won't change whether they're orthogonal to each other. So that's how we get the, the orthogonal basis for W. The radical's easy, any basis for the radical will work. All the elements have length zero and they all perp with everything. So that's not a problem. And then if you got a hyperbolic plane, you got some you got two generators that are isotropic vectors. You can't use those because they perp with each other to be one, and we need them to perp with each other to be zero. But x plus y and x minus y will will work for a basis of the hyperbolic plane. And then you just combine the three bases and then you got your orthogonal basis. And that's that. And that's all I have for today. So have a good day and see you hopefully soon for the next time.